Hudson E. Berg asks, why do you see any legitimacy in your system of morality? That is to say, where is the objective obligation? There is no objective obligation. That is a feature, not a bug. I'm an anti-realist. Um, if you want to talk about legitimacy, broadly speaking, well, I can give arguments for my moral positions. I can show that my moral views are consistent. I can uh, show that my moral views conform to intuitions in certain important cases and so on. You know, I can engage in the same kinds of arguments that realists engage in, but I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in trying to show that there are objective obligations. Um, what, meta uh, what metaphysics as well as ontology do you subscribe to? Well, none. I am a pretty hardcore empiricist, uh, so I reject metaphysical speculation in general. I, I would not say that I accept any particular metaphysical theory. I think that the entire field is misguided. Inventive harvest. Can the is-ought problem be solved with the economics idea that if the benefits of an action exceed the cost of doing that action, then more of that action should be done? Uh, sorry, I just got a Okay, not important. Um, so I'm, I'm not so familiar with economics, but uh, no, I, I don't think you can solve the problem in that way. Um, I mean, I don't, okay, I don't know exactly what argument you have in mind, right? So maybe I shouldn't say that. But if we just take uh, the proposition, the benefits of X exceed the cost of X, right? Well, does that entail that you ought to do X? Well, no, of course not. Um, <laughs> that doesn't entail anything about what you ought to do, unless you also include in the premises, you know, some claim about what you ought to do. Um, but look, I mean, in general, you don't need to solve the is ought problem um, because you can just put an ought in the premises, right? If you want to derive some claim about what you ought to do, right, you can just in, in the premises of your argument include an ought claim, right? So you can say, you ought to do things when the benefits exceed the costs. And then if you can show that the benefits of X exceed the costs of X, well, you can get the conclusion that you ought to do X. Um, that's, that's enough. The, the is ought gap is just a point about the conservativeness of logic. Um, you don't need, as a moral realist, to solve it. Um, and I don't think that anti-realists should use this as an objection to moral realism. So the is ought gap, I think, is not, it's not really a problem to be solved. Um, at least as far as I'm concerned. You know, there's a nice example that I think it comes from Charles Pigden, um, I think. Uh, he says, you know, that this is no different to the uh, hedgehog, non-hedgehog gap, right? So you cannot get a conclusion about hedgehogs from premises that say nothing about hedgehogs, okay? Uh, but we're still realists about hedgehogs. You know, you still think that hedgehogs exist. But if you're saying nothing, if your premises say nothing about hedgehogs, then you're not going to get a conclusion about hedgehogs. That's just because logic is conservative. You don't get out more than what you put in. Um, so it's the same kind of thing here, right? The is ought gap, I think, is not something that you're going to solve, but you don't really need to solve it. And insofar as there are problems with moral realism, and there certainly are problems with moral realism, um, they're not really about the is ought gap, at least in my view. Okay, James asks, you have described yourself as a libertarian, but you seem to have identified less with right libertarianism over time. What made you change your mind? Um, I think that it's just I came to see right libertarianism as being in conflict with the, the sort of individualist values um, that had driven me towards right libertarianism in the first place. You know, I mean, like a lot of, I think the, the kind of people who become right libertarians tend to be fairly individualist. Um, but I eventually came to see it as being in conflict with individualism. Um, you know, it's, it's just in the way that it demands that I respect uh, certain systems of property rights, for instance. Um, you know, I, I, can't, uh, I, I can't see why I, I should do that. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, and I think that at the end of the day, um, like private uh, companies can be just as much a source of oppression as can governments. I mean, it's ultimately like control of the individual that bothers me. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just, it's not just government that does that. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I think that's the fundamental reason, but there are lots of other reasons as well, right? Like, so in terms of the 
right libertarian conception of property rights, um, well, it, there's just like a host of problems in trying to make that coherent. So, you know, you ask the question of, OK, under what circumstances does somebody legitimately own property? How do we come to own property in the first place? Um, like, why exactly is it that if we have something which is currently unowned, right, why exactly is it that we should suppose that you can, that by mixing your labour with that, you come to own it um, and that, you know, you you own the full value of that rather than it just being that, you know, you own the added value that your labour produces. Um, so, you know, uh, the an alternative would be to say, well, it's not that you come to have full ownership of it, rather you own the added value of your labour and then you have to pay compensation to the community um, for the, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the original value of the resources or something along those lines, right? I mean, I can't see any kind of clear reason in principle for preferring one of those claims to the other. So like, yeah. I, and then there's a the question of like, okay, how much labour mixing is required for you to come to own something? And, you know, um, how much like above and below the land do you own, etc. Um, plus, I think that right libertarianism often ends up finding itself with um, genuinely ridiculous conclusions in terms of things like the environment. Now, actually, my position on this is somewhat opposite to what the standard position is, because a lot of people think that libertarianism is incompatible with environmentalism. I think the problem is the exact opposite. I think that it's too environmentalist in the sense that the constraints that it imposes are far too strong. So um, the, the problem is that uh, from a libertarian point of view, it's unclear how it can be legitimate to engage in any activity which produces any environmental damage whatsoever. There's a nice article on this by Matt Zwolinski, and I can't remember what the name of the article is, but if you just type in libertarianism environment Matt Zwolinski on Google, um, you know, you'll find a discussion of this. But um, if we think that, um, so look, here's, here's the thing, right? I can't, um, under right libertarianism, you know, uh, take, I can't take a bit of money from somebody uh, in order to use that money to uh, alleviate poverty, right? So, um, you know, if, if there's some like rich person who's got loads and loads of money and then there's people starving, um, it's not legitimate under right libertarianism to take the money from that rich person uh, to support the people starving. So there are really strong constraints on what you can, like you, you can't um, steal or damage people's property, right? Even if this would produce really positive consequences for anybody else. But in the same way, right, um, if you think about, say, like dumping toxic waste, well, obviously that's ruled out. If I dump toxic waste in a river, that's going to damage property that's owned by other people. Um, but it's not just dumping toxic waste that will damage other people's property, right? There are loads of things that we do which will also constitute damage by via damaging the environment. You know, the uh, the way in which, for instance, um, a company might uh, uh, have lots of trucks driving around, you know, that's going to give off emissions which will damage the environment. Um, now that seems like it's going to be, if you if you have this sort of strict view of property rights that you can't do anything which um, you know, harms another person or damages their property, uh, then that's just not going to be legitimate. Like you're not going to be able to uh, have lots of trucks on the road because they will give off emissions that will, in a very, very minor way, uh, damage the property of others. Um, so, you know, it seems like that sort of, that sort of thing is, uh, is a problem. And also there's the problem of like, um, it seems that the the kind of libertarian conception of justice is sort of inapplicable insofar as uh, the libertarian conception of distributive justice is inapplicable insofar as we know that historically um i mean people have acquired their their wealth when you go back far enough in history via all sorts of theft and conquest and so um it just isn't clear who would uh, be who would actually have the right to that wealth, you know? Um, so there's just all sorts of problems with right libertarianism. Um, and it seems that, I, I think that conceptions of left libertarianism, which just, where well, you don't have to think about historical uh, distributions of property and how particular property distributions came about and all of this, um, is just much more straightforward. 
Um, so, so yeah, I think left libertarianism is is more in line with my individualist values, and it doesn't face um, this mountain of conceptual problems that right libertarianism seems to face. Um, hopefully, that answers the question. I feel like that was a bit roundly, but um, you know, I'm I'm kind of talking off the top of my head here, so uh, <laughs> that's the best you got. Right, Jamando Ondami asks. Why don't you utilize people on your Discord server for making better videos? For example, asking around for an expert on the topic. Um, the server is dead by now. Uh, maybe ask for community help on a revival. Yeah, I don't, you know, I made that Discord server and, and I don't really know what to do with it. So um, I probably should have thought about that a bit more, like, before I made it. But I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do with it. So... I, I guess I could ask for, I mean, I actually am planning on doing more collaborative videos in the future, so um, that will probably happen, but I don't know how the Discord will feature in that. Um, okay, you also ask if I'm going to do more on political theory one day. I am certainly planning on doing more, yeah. I'd like to do more videos on uh, on anarchism and so on. Um, I mean, just because I'm I'm very interested in anarchism now, and you know, there's a there's a lot to be said there. Um, but I'd actually I, I think you know I never studied political theory when I was doing my degree, or when I did my masters, or during my PhD. I've never taken a course on political philosophy. Um, so what I know about political philosophy, I've basically taught myself. Um, and I realised you know I I was planning for a while on doing like a series on anarchism, but I think actually. Um, before I do that, I want to do a bit more on views that I just straightforwardly disagree with. I've got some plans for a video on nationalism. I don't know when I'm going to get that done, but hopefully within the next couple of months I should have a video on that, because obviously that's something that is just completely contrary to my own uh, political views. Um, but I kind of think that's important, you know, to uh, explore alternative positions. So that will be coming shortly. I mean, well, I did the video on anarcho-primitivism because I was inter you know, I've got interested in anarchism. And at the time, I just thought primitivism is ridiculous, right? Like, who could take this seriously? But then I was like, well, you know, come on, right? We're, we're, a philo we're, we're doing philosophy here. We're supposed to um, explore what seem like ridiculous positions. And then actually, I found um, when I did the video on primitivism, when I started really uh, exploring it seriously, I'm, there's some really interesting arguments there, uh, and it's, I, I would say, has had some influence on um, my own perspective. So, um, yeah, there's a great value in, uh, in, in exploring views that you disagree with, uh, so there'll be a bit of that going on in the future, um, but I don't know when. Um, you ask, is there a purpose in life for everyone, not just for doing things in life, but life itself? I think the idea of a purpose for life is incoherent. Um, people create purposes for themselves. Um, there are very few people who will think of their life as a whole as having some sort of purpose. I mean, it's not clear what that would even mean, right? Like, even if you're religious and you say, for instance, the purpose of my life is to serve God. Well, the trouble is you're going to be doing lots of other things in your life as well. Um, you're going to have lots of other purposes. And it's not clear why we should suppose that this one purpose of serving God um, would, you know, overrule all of the others. I mean, that may be how you choose to interpret your life, but it, it's not clear that other people would have to interpret your life and your behaviour um, as in that way, right? Like, so if somebody is religious, but they're doing lots of other things, I might say, well, actually, no, um, you're wrong. When you say that the purpose of your life is to serve God, um, that's just, that's not a useful way of thinking about um, the purposes that you're actually pursuing. I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that people can be mistaken about what their purposes are. Um, so, um, so and, and yeah, and so the idea of somebody having a purpose for their life, I think I would just say that that doesn't really make sense. Uh, of course, if there is a God, I suppose it might make sense to say that he had some purpose in mind when he created humanity, and maybe human lives um, have a purpose in virtue of God having a purpose when he created us. But there's no reason why we would have to agree with that purpose or ha would have to pursue that purpose ourselves. Um, 
I mean, indeed, we have no access to God's mind, if indeed there is a God. Uh, so we have no idea what what his purpose was in creating us. Uh, we have no choice but to make our own purposes. Um, so, yeah, uh, all of this, I think, leads me to think that the very idea of like a purpose for life is just incoherent, not a useful way of thinking. You ask, it ever had an interest in making an ethics of suicide lecture? What about criticism of psychiatry? Um, ethics of suicide, I'm probably, I'm probably not going to do that. Um, that just seems like an easy one to me, you know. Like, I think it's obviously, obviously permissible. Um, and I, I actually would go further and say I don't think there's anything wrong with encouraging people to commit suicide. Um, I don't agree that, like... I don't agree with the sort of default assumption that people um, that, you know, continuing one's life is like prima facie the right thing to do. I mean, if somebody wants to commit suicide, I'd like go ahead, you know. Um, it, yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, I, there's a debate about that, obviously. But the thing is, it doesn't seem that, that there's much public interest in that debate at the moment. So you know, if I was to do a lecture on it, it would be a lecture about a topic that, honestly, I'm not that interested in, a topic that uh, I I think it, I find the answer to be obvious, and um, a topic that probably wouldn't get a lot of clicks, you know, <laughs> like that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't get a lot of views, uh, because there doesn't seem to be that much interest in it at the moment, so I'm probably not going to do that. Um, Criticism of psychiatry. Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm qualified um, to do that, so uh, that probably won't happen. Joel Dixon asks for my thoughts on accelerationism. The relationship between politics and emotion is a very deep one, in my opinion, and it seems like everyone who knows about it feels strongly one way or the other. Well, I don't know much about it, and I don't feel strongly about it. I'm not sure I really understand what accelerationism is, but insofar as, like, okay, am I correct in this? But the basic idea of accelerationism is that you're you're aiming to essentially make the current situation worse in order to provoke a revolutionary sentiment among the population, right? Like, that's the context in which I... So it's, it's like, uh, you know, somebody who's left-wing who wants socialism... Um, will say, well, actually, we should, you know, vote for Donald Trump, right? Because that will make the conditions of capitalism even worse. You know, that will accelerate capitalism and that will prompt people to uh, en engage in revolutionary activity. Is that, that, that's the idea, right, I think? Um, I mean, uh, that seems kind of like a, well, that's, that's sort of a practical point, right? It's a claim about how best to achieve... Um, in that case, socialist goals, but I suppose you could make the same claim about all sorts of other political goals. Um, but yeah, it's a claim about how best to achieve whatever it is we take the uh, the ideal to be. Um, uh, I, I'm kind of on the fence about whether that's a good way to achieve those goals. Uh, I mean, my, my own inclination um, is to say we should just do what we can to make the world better now and um, so I, I guess I would be inclined against accelerationism. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 OK, I, I probably shouldn't talk about this because I really, really don't know uh, anything about this. I just haven't thought about it. So um, I think that even attempting to um, say anything interesting here would be uh, a complete waste of time. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to move on, I'm afraid. Uh, Johannes Heinle. Uh, says, which philosophical problems, if any, do you think will be solved in your lifetime? Are there any philosophical questions you think we'll never be able to answer? This depends on what constitutes a solution, because I think that we've solved loads of philosophical problems. The thing is, we don't have a consensus. I, for example, would say that actually we know that moral realism is false, right? So I think we've based, I think metaethics, we've, we pretty much know the solution to that, right? Um, but obviously, there are lots of really intelligent people who know the literature very well who completely disagree with me. There's no consensus. Um, so if you're asking for me, like, will, will, will these problems be solved? Well, I can give you loads of problems that have been solved. Unfortunately, uh, n very few people accept the solutions. Um, 
So if you're asking, will we achieve a consensus on these problems? Um, I mean, I really don't know. I don't know uh, if there are any major philosophical problems that I expect will, um, will, will see a consensus emerge. And even if we did have a consensus, I think it would be sort of fragile in the sense that um, you know, it wouldn't be like lasting, you know, uh, like there's currently a consensus on uh, physicalism, but I don't expect that to last. Uh, I think that's more a kind of, eh, I think that's more a kind of bandwagoning, to be honest, like the actual arguments for it seem to me to be pretty weak. Um, so I don't expect that consensus to to last. Um, and I mean, actually, I say the arguments are weak. It's not just that. It's also that there are increasing numbers of philosophers who are taking seriously um, alternative metaphysical views. You know, there are increasing numbers of people going towards panpsychism or idealism. You know, we're starting to see these views be rehabilitated. We're also starting to see people just kind of reject um, like the the idea that physicalism is even coherent as a metaphysical doctrine, um, you know. So uh, th there are lots of ways in which that consensus is breaking down. And I think the arguments were never really there in the first place. So um, there may well be consensus on certain big topics, but I don't think it would be, you know, lasting consensus. I think that the, the big questions of philosophy um, are probably never going to be resolved at least not in the way that you resolve questions in science. Um, you said in an earlier video that you are tired of your PhD project and you want to read more about other topics after it. What philosophical topics do you want to explore more after the PhD? Um, I want to do more meta-ethics. I'm getting really into that again. I think that, you know, I did the meta-ethics series and I have periodically done videos on meta-ethics since then. Um, but there's just so many arguments that I think need to, that I want to just explore in a lot more detail, you know, um, there's, there's a lot more to be said. And um, so I, I, I've always been really interested in meta-ethics um, and I want to explore it more. Um, also, uh, we're in epistemology in general. Um, I want to do more on rationality. Um, I want to think more about rationality. I'm in particular interested in uh, what I would call a kind of epistemic anarchism, which is the idea that there are just no rules of belief formation, right? Like, so rational belief formation um, does not, is not constrained by any rules whatsoever. And I come to this position, so um, there's a position held by Baz van Frassen called epistemic voluntarism. And um, Voluntarism for Van Frassen is, is the view that the only uh, constraints on rational belief formation uh, are logical and probabilistic coherence. So your beliefs have to be you know, logically consistent and they have to be coherent with the axioms of probability theory. Or not just beliefs, but like your degrees of belief have to be logically consistent and um, probabilistically coherent. Um, but beyond that, according to Van Frassen at least, they're just like rationality is 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 silent um so um i i i am attracted to this kind of position but i think that um i think that van frassen's position is both sort of too strict and too loose right so it's too strict in so far as i don't think that even logical laws constitute constraints on belief formation right i don't think that there are like laws of logic. I mean, you know, there's been a whole proliferation of different logical systems. And, um, you know, I don't think there are any universally, there are any universal logical laws that govern rational belief formation. Um, so in that sense, the voluntarist is too strict. I'm also inclined to think, though, that the voluntarist is too, um, you know, uh, uh, loose insofar as uh, for Van Frassen, Right. Once you've got a system of beliefs that is logically consistent and probabilistically coherent, there's just nothing more to say. Whereas I think there is something more to say. I mean, it seems like we want to say, for instance, that like, even if there were somebody who was a flat earther who was uh, somehow able to make that logically consistent and probabilistically coherent, that would still be um, irrational. I mean, in particular, it seems like for 
this kind of voluntarist position, it's possible to just reject evidence, right? So um, think of, say, um, you know, a flat earther, right? If you show a flat earther a photograph of the earth, um, they won't just reject the evidence. What they'll try to do is they'll engage in lots of ad hoc maneuvers um, to try to show that this photograph of the earth um, actually doesn't support the view that the earth is a globe. Um, so, you know, they'll say that this is some conspiracy by NASA. But what they could do, right, is just say, like, I just don't accept that, like, I just, I just, like, I, I don't even, like, accept that you've shown me a photograph, right? So you hold up the photograph to them, you say, what about this photograph? They just say, what photograph? I don't see a photograph. Um, what person? I don't think there's a person there holding up a photograph. You can just reject evidence, right? Um, it seems like if the only constraint on rational belief formation is, uh, it is kind of structural, is like logical, then um, there's not anything necessarily irrational in doing that. And that just seems kind of absurd to me. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in thinking more about rationality and I'm interested in exploring uh, a, a view of rationality where it is not rule based. Um, and these are, yeah, so I, okay, I've been talking, I, 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 I'm going to move on now because, um, again, I haven't uh, got a clear position on this, but that, these are the sort of topics that I'm interested in exploring. John asks, what is the biggest problem in philosophy right now, in your opinion? I, I honestly don't know. Um, I, I mean, there are, there are problems that I find more or less interesting. You know, I've always been very interested in uh, the scientific realism, anti-realism debate. Um, that's what I've done most of my work on. But I don't necessarily see that as a big problem. I mean, it's not, so it's not big in the sense that um, I struggle with it. Like I've actually got pretty clear views on this now. So I, I'm, I'm definitely firmly on the anti-realist side. So uh, in that sense, I don't see it as a big problem because like I've, yeah, I've, I've got a very clear position. Same with, you know, moral realism, moral anti-realism, right? Like I'm just very clearly a moral anti-realist. And so in that sense, it's not a big problem to me because it's not a problem that I struggle with. Um, so I, I don't know, I guess it depends on what you would, yeah, what you consider, um, the conditions for something to be a, a big problem. Um, but though, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know how to answer that. <laughs> um, John Smith, um, what do you expect your life will be like in five years time? Uh, I don't think about the future. Uh, I'm, I'm very much an episodic, uh, as uh, I think Strawson distinguishes people who are you know, episodics and people who are narrative right so the the episodic person is somebody who just tends to live kind of in the moment and they don't think about the past or the future and they uh just deal with sort of problems as they arise somebody who is a uh, more narrative uh has a more narrative conception of themselves will think of themselves over a long period of time they will think of their life as being a kind of story you know they will reflect on the past think about the future um so the point of all of this is no i am very very firmly episodic i always have been um i i never really think about my future and i i never re reflect on my past so uh i don't have any particular expectations about what my life will be like i do think that you know I mean, I'm going to carry on doing philosophy in one way or another. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, I'll still have the YouTube going. Hopefully I'll be doing some sort of job that I can enjoy at least somewhat. Um, but I don't know whether I'll be successful at that. Um, what else? I don't know. I feel like I'm probably going to be about the same as I am now. I, I'd be surprised if there are any major changes in five years. If you make it like 20 years, then, you know, civilization will probably have collapsed due to climate change. So things will be different by then. But yeah, five years, I think, be about the same. Um, uh, ju uh, Juanmar or Wanmar or however that's pronounced. What do you think about the fungibility of love? Unconditional love seems pretty undesirable since our love would be arbitrary and we wouldn't be able to, to leave no matter how much the other person changed. But if we accept that love is conditional, 
that we love people based on the characteristics they have, then if hypothetically we, create, we could create a strictly more lovable person, a perfect replica of your loved one, even containing their memories, except they have one more positive characteristic to them, um, wouldn't we be forced to keep switching partners infinitely under a, under a conditional account of love? There's got to be a middle ground here, surely, um, and that's probably how it works. So once you fall in love with somebody, uh, you value that person in particular in a very special kind of way. You form an attachment to that person. Uh, that's, that's how love works, right? And um, so, you know, that, that doesn't mean that love is unconditional. Obviously, if that person departs too far from our ideal, then, you know, we will, we will move on. Uh, so you... So, okay, I've, I've fallen in love with this person, right? And I have a special attachment to that person, um, which means even if I meet somebody who seems like they might be better according to my, what might initially have been my ideal, I'm still gonna go for this original person because that's the person I formed an attachment to. But if that person departs too, too far from my ideal, then I'm, I'm gonna you know, give up. I guess this is kind of like a sort of threshold deontology but for love, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, anyway, um, I mean, there's good reasons to set things up this way because like, imagine if your, if your relationships uh, were abandoned every time it looked like you, it looked like somebody better turned up, right? Um, we would, you know, we'd always, all of us would be insecure in our relationships and we'd never really be able to form like deep, long-term, meaningful commitments. Um, and anyway, you know, our judgments of whether or not somebody is a good match for us are often unreliable. Like it takes a long time to get to know somebody and you never can be entirely sure who you're going to click with, right? Sometimes you end up clicking with people who, if you've just been told about their properties, if you've just been told about their characteristics, you might not have thought you would have gotten along so well with. There can be surprises. Um, so, I mean, if you find somebody that you love, it's obviously uh, a, good, a good policy to form an attachment to that specific person. Um, but that doesn't mean that it has to be completely unconditional. So yeah, I, I think that you've sort of set up a bit of a false uh, dichotomy here, and that there is a reasonable middle path, which is the way that actually all of our minds work. Um, Logvas, what do you think about Quine's regimentation theory? So, uh, the idea that scientific theories should be regimented, um, yeah, uh, well, all right, so I guess there's two points about this. So the, the first point is, is, I mean, just before we even get into any of the, the sort of philosophy stuff, right, is this a reasonable picture of, of science? I mean, so there's, there's a worry here that this kind of approach to scientific theories rests on... Um, just an outdated view of how scientific theories work. So in particular, I would worry that the role of models in scientific practice is being overlooked. Because, um, I mean, okay, my understanding is the basic idea of regimentation is that we're supposed to translate the uh, statements of, of sciences into uh, like a clear, precise language of first order logic. That's pretty much the idea, right? But Many of our theories connect to the world via models. Um, so, you know, we use Newton's laws to construct models of the pendulum or models of the solar system. Or we um, we might appeal to certain um, biological concepts to construct uh, models of specific populations, models of interactions between biological entities, like, um, you know, the locker Volterra model of predator-prey interactions. Now, the standard account of models in philosophy of science is that they are non-linguistic abstract objects. So it just doesn't make sense to talk about like translating these statements into first order logic because they're not statements. They're not collections of statements. They are abstract objects uh, that are non-linguistic. Um, so, I mean, you might, you know, reject that view, but the point is that, um, you know, if you accept that consensus, then um, obviously talking about regimenting these, talking about theories as if they are just sets of statements is kind of misguided. Um, the other point I would make uh, is that even if we do think of theories as being sets of statements, I think that the idea of um, kind of constructing a theory in a rigorous and precise language is, is kind of misguided, right? I think that um, 
how should I put this, uh, sort of conceptual openness, uh, let's say, um, or, or the kind of vagueness of certain concepts is an essential part of, of scientific progress. And this is because um, conceptual fragmentation often plays uh, an important role in promoting scientific progress. So, you know, we have a concept such as the concept of species, let's say, and, you know, we can then start to ask, okay, what does this mean, right? What is this concept? And we, we might propose definitions. So we, we give necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of the concept, but there will be many proposed analyses. Um, and none of these analyses are likely to capture everything that you know, are likely to play like every role that the original concept played. So in the case of species, um, you know, you have uh, about 40 different definitions of species in the literature. You know, you've got the the interbreeding criterion where we say that some two, two organisms are members of the species if they can interbreed. You've got the ecological species concept. You've got a whole bunch of phylogenetic species concepts. And the thing is, is that, you know, we had this original concept of species and it wasn't precise. Uh, it wasn't, you know, regimented. Um, and that concept has now broken down and fragmented. And these concepts turn out to be useful in different contexts. So there's all kinds of contexts in which we talk about species and which species concept we apply depends on the context. Now, here's the thing. If you look at, say, the interbreeding criterion or the ecological criterion, it turns out um, that these will also fragment, right? Like as we do more studies, as we learn more things, we, we need more specific versions of these concepts. So we get um, a load of different ways of defining interbreeding and we get different ways of defining the e what counts as an ecological niche. And so the concepts split again. And I think that that's probably an important part of scientific progress, that, that, that part of the progress is the conceptual progress and the more precise definitions. And so, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily a problem for Quine, but I just feel like um, allowing that there's this vagueness in concepts and keeping concepts open um, is an important part of promoting scientific progress. So, um, again, maybe that's not really a problem for Quine, but if you were to, I, I guess my thought is, well, if you were to, you know, regiment the language and to say, well, this is the concept, then it, it, it seems like you couldn't, you know, you wouldn't have that openness anymore. So, um, so yeah, that's that's another worry. Now, obviously, Quine is, you know, not just talking about science here. He's trying to draw philosophical conclusions from it, um, particularly conclusions about the ontology of the world. Now, I can say this. Um, I mean, I'm not a scientific realist, so I don't uh, like. Even if we were to do this regimentation of theory. Uh, there would be, in my view, no reason to suppose that this theory um, actually tells us anything about the way the world is. Uh, um, but even putting aside my scientific anti-realism, you know, even if I were a realist, I think I would have some problems with the the way in which Quine thinks about ontological commitment. So Quine. Quine is trying to minimise ontological commitment, right? Like, I mean, he's he's kind of coming at this from the point of view of, um, like, we we want to streamline our theory. We want to find out what's, like, what's actually essential for the theory to function, and we're trying to, we're, yeah, we're trying to minimise the the ontological commitments we're making. I'm just not sure why ontology w should be restricted in that way. Um, if you're if you buy um, scientific realism and you buy into uh, you know, inference to the best explanation. Um, well, you know, the best explanations are produced by, like, science, right? Not by the philosopher's regimented science. Um, uh, I, I mean, I can't help but feel that Quine is sort of applying norms that seem to be somewhat removed from those which govern scientific practice. And if you want to be a scientific realist, it's surely, you know, I feel like scientific practice is what matters. Um, like if, you if you're going to take science to be the best guide to the way the world is, I mean, just look at science, right? We don't need to like perform further philosophical operations on it. And if you start performing further operations on it, um, then, you know, you're now producing something which is 
at a step removed from science. So, um, so, so yeah, I, I think that I, I have worries about, like, even from a realist point of view, uh, that kind of approach to ontological commitment, I'm not sure I would buy. I think if I'm going to be a realist, I'd just, I'd just say, you know, just take the science as it is. Um, um, yeah. Um, I mean, also, if we, if we are minimising ontological commitment, it does occur to me that uh, you would kind of undermine the grounds for supposing that science um, gives us the facts about the world in the first place. Because, um, like, the, the more it turns out that certain scientific theories are postulating entities or objects and processes that do not exist, um, then the more counterexamples we will have to the idea that uh, the success of our theories indicates their truth. Um, so minimising ontological commitment is um, possibly self-undermining from a scientific realist point of view. Does that make sense? Anyway, um, okay, that's, that's all I've got to say about that. Uh, what set theory axioms do you prefer? I have no opinion whatsoever. I don't do set theory. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, so I can't say anything. Um, Luminos, do you think more philosophy programs should teach or incorporate non-Western philosophies? Um, what are your thoughts on non-Western philosophies? Have you studied or taken a class on them? Nope, I have, I have no real thoughts. Um, I haven't studied them. So uh, I have nothing to say about non-Western philosophy. As for whether philosophy programs should teach them, um, I don't. I mean, I don't care. Like if they want, I don't. I'm I'm all in favour of, you know, exploring different philosophical traditions, but I don't think it's required. Um, obviously, if I had spent any time that I spent during my degree doing studying non-Western philosophies. Um, would have been time taken away from studying the things I was really interested in. So um, I think that it's probably a good thing for universities to offer uh, lots of different options so that students can study different things. And then, you know, people will have uh, different backgrounds, but that's, that's, that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's sort of what we should... I mean, if we're going to be supposing, as I suppose, that a plural, plural, pluralism... Uh, of philosophical methods is a good thing, then um, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 I'm fine with how things are, I guess. Uh, low wattage amp. What is your view on analytic metaphysics? Oh well, it's kind of sad, isn't it? Because analytic philosophy was kind of born in rebellion against metaphysics, but soon metaphysics became rehabilitated. Um, no, I'm, I'm a very, very hardcore empiricist. I don't go in for uh, metaphysical speculation, metaphysical theorising. I think it is fundamentally misguided. But even though it's fundamentally misguided, it's also quite a lot of fun. Um, I do enjoy reading analytic metaphysics sometimes. So, uh, yeah. Um, Micah Savela, what is your favourite art movements? I've already answered this uh, to Eduardo C, so I'll put a link to that I'll, in, in the description thing. Mason Hart, what are your thoughts on the ontology of mathematical objects? Well, I'm certainly not a Platonist, um, but beyond that, I can't really say much because I haven't studied enough philosophy of mathematics to have a clear position of my own. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, M M Miller Osbal. How can we justify the truth of principles like identity, non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, modus ponens, tollens? These are principles called laws of thought or principles of logic. Many philosophers say they're justified by intuition. If intuition is not that reliable source, how can we rely on logic? Well, we can't, we can't justify them because I don't think they are true. Um, so, OK, look, when we're constructing a logic, you know, um, I mean, there are lots of different things we might do. There are lots of different... Uh, 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 things that we can do with a formal logic. I mean, logic is just like, a logic is just a formal system, and we can apply that in lots of different contexts. But when philosophers talk about logic, we're not just using it as a mathematical formalism. Generally, um, if we are asking, you know, which one is the, is the true logic, or which one is the right logic, um, then the question is going to be, which of these logics captures correct reasoning? Um, which of these logics 
um, kind of co correctly accommodates the rules of reason. But in my view, there are no such rules. Um, I don't think that, yeah, so um, I, I think that, you know, how do we, how do we justify logics? Well, it's, it's kind of just a practical matter. I mean, it's, it's just whatever works and different logics work in different contexts. Um, you know, if you're talking about non-contradiction, for instance, well, in the vast majority of cases, we can just use classical logic. And um, obviously in classical logic, um, from a contradiction, anything follows. So uh, yeah, you, you, need to, you need to avoid non-contradiction. But actually there are um, certain specific scenarios in which um, I'd be happy to say that there just are true contradictions. I mean, I don't know like, if this is really a, uh, a, like a strong view of mine or anything, but um, I'm, I'm quite, I have some inclination to the position that contradictions arise as um, what I think J.C. Beall calls spandrels of truth. So when a language um, acquires sufficient expressive power, uh, you will just it will just generate contradiction, certain contradictory statements, um, just as a product of uh, its expressive power. So in particular, when you have a language that has a truth predicate and the ability to construct self-referential sentences, um, then you're just going to get contradictions following from that in things like the liar sentence, you know, this sentence is false. Um, now, of course, you don't have to analyze that as a true contradiction. There are lots of different um, uh, proposed analyses of what's going on in the liar sentence, and there are lots of different versions of the liar sentence. I mean, ultimately, it seems to me that the simplest thing to say about at least some of these cases is just to accept that they are true contradictions, and so classical logic doesn't apply. We have to apply a paraconsistent logic. Um, but the, I mean, yeah, the, the basic idea that there are um, these universal principles of reasoning, right? These universal principles that could constrain rational belief formation in all contexts. I just reject that. I don't see any reason to accept it. So um, I don't think that we need to justify the truth of these principles, uh, as, as you put it. Um, I think my, yeah, I, I, I have a completely different take on what's going on here. Um, logic is uh, an extremely useful tool, but uh, it is, at the end of the day, just a tool. Um, okay, um, Mujta, Mujtaba Shanan, what could be an argument for moral nihilism that you would consider appealing? Depends on what moral nihilism is. Moral nihilism, I mean, if we just mean moral anti-realism, um, like, I, I think that um, there are certain forms, say, of the queerness argument that are quite convincing. So there are problems with, you know, the notion of uh, categorical reasons, right? The idea that, um, like, when I say, for instance, that you ought not to own slaves, well, the idea of that, so, so the idea is that um, as a moral claim, right, that holds regardless of what your desires are. So, you know, you cannot release yourself from that ob obligation by, by saying, well, you know, I want to own slaves, right? So um, if I tell you that, uh, you know, it's cold outside, so you ought to put on a coat, um, you can say, and you can release yourself from the obligation by saying, yeah, but I don't care about being cold, right? I actually like being cold um, every now and then, so I'm going to go outside without a coat, right? Um, if you like being cold, then the fact that wearing a coat would prevent you from being cold no longer constitutes a reason for you to wear a coat. Um, that's not the case with morality. With morality, right, moral constraints are categorical. They hold regardless of what your desires are. And um, I think that it is difficult to make sense of what on earth is going on there, right? Um, so yeah, this is, I think, a fairly common argument among moral anti-realists, um, but it's you know one that I, I think I would endorse in some form. Um, also, I I mean I like you know evolutionary debunking arguments. Um, I recently did a video where I suggested that morality might just be incoherent in certain ways. Um, so. Uh, I mean, yeah, there, there's there's lots of arguments out there, um, and there are many of them that you know push me in an anti-realist direction. And I would say there's you know pretty much 
I don't know. There isn't really anything that pushes me in a realist direction. I mean, ultimately, like, there's literally... I, I just have never encountered anything that I would consider to be a good reason to be a moral realist. Um, like, I have never encountered an argument where I've thought... <laughs> where I sort of felt the pull of moral realism, you know? Um, and that, I mean, like, there are very intelligent people who defend moral realism. And, you know, there are very philosophically sophisticated arguments in favour of moral realism. But ultimately, none of them have moved me even slightly. Um, so I guess for me, you know, the, the, the case for moral anti-realism is there are just a lot of considerations that push me in an anti-realist direction and no considerations that are pushing me in a realist direction. Um, but that might not be what you had in mind with moral nihilism, because, you know, nihilism is maybe a bit more specific, but unfortunately, um, I, I'm not sure what you have in mind, so that's all I can say. Um, Nemanja Petrovic says, do you find Galen Strawson's basic argument convincing? Um, I, I've already uh, talked about, like, free will, um, um, so I, maybe I'll put a you know, link to where I've talked about that before. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are, there are ba basically there are two options here. I mean, option number one is to sort of take the Strawsonian view and say, well, there's just no such thing as free will or responsibility. It's incoherent. Um, uh, in that case, though, it's still going to be useful in various contexts to act as if people had free will, um, to act as if people were responsible for certain things that they do. Um, like, there's no, I don't think there's any getting around the fact that there is some utility to these concepts. So even if the idea of moral responsibility is just completely incoherent, um, and it may well be, um, I, I, I still think it's going to be useful in certain contexts to act as if people were responsible for things that they do. Um, so that's option number one, is to say that this stuff is just incoherent, but it's useful to act as if it were the case. Option number two is to say, well, there is such a thing as free will, and we, we are, you know, responsible for some of our actions, but um, free will is, is constituted by a whole bunch of, like, just capacities that are compatible with determinism. So capacities, like, you know, our capacity to have, to engage in rational thought, to engage in abstract thought, our capacity for second order desires, um, uh, like, that's, like it, just those capacities in themselves constitute free will. So yes, Strawson is right that you know ultimately all of our decisions um, are produced by things that are outside of our control, but that just doesn't matter because what free will actually is, right, just is these capacities. Um, and so I don't really care which of these options we take. I don't really care if we say that free will is incoherent, but it's useful to act as if people have free will, or if we say that no, there is free will, but we take this like pragmatic compatibilist line on it. I, I don't think there's much of a difference between these positions. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to the, the second one, you know, to say that that there is free will and it's, but we, we're going to take a pragmatic compatibilist line, but I, I don't think it's that important. Uh, do you find Mackie's queerness argument um, you know, just, where is that? Okay, do you find Mackie's queerness argument convincing? Um, I find uh, uh, certain forms of it convincing, at least. Um, uh, as I just mentioned in response to the, um, well, there was some other previous question. I find um, the uh, uh, categorical normativity certainly puzzling, right? So the, the kind of authority of morality, right? How could somebody have a reason for action that is independent of their desires, right? That kind of thing um, is one thing among many that pushes me more in an anti-realist direction. Um, but, you know, I mean, I certainly wouldn't propose the argument from queerness as being in any way a knockdown argument against moral realism, right? It isn't. It's, it's, it's one plank uh, of the anti-realist case. It's, 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 it's one point among many um, that an anti-realist can make in favour of anti-realism. Um, I, I don't think philosophy ever has any... I don't think there are any knockdown arguments in philosophy, right? We know we're, all, we're always weighing up lots of different considerations. It so happens that I do find um, at least certain forms of the queerness argument push me, you know, in, in the anti-realist direction. 
Um, and then there are lots of other things pushing me in that direction as well. Um, thoughts on Blackburn's projectivism slash quasi-realism? Well, okay, projectivism slash quasi-realism, I think you there shouldn't be a slash there, because those are very different things. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, my understanding is the idea of projectivism, I mean, you, you can... Like you can be an error theorist, say, and and endorse a projectivist account. In fact, Mackey um, endorsed a projectivist account of um, like why people. So he, he endorsed a projectivist account of why we think of the world as having moral properties, right? So for Mackey, you know, we are projecting our values right onto the world. Um, you know, Blackburn would similarly make a similar projectivist claim. Um, Quasi realism is the m much more specifically the attempt to save the kind of realist surface of moral discourse um, its attempt to uh, vindicate perhaps i should say realist intuitions um, but from the point of view of an anti-realist metaphysic um, you can be a projectivist and reject quasi-realism and you can be a quasi-realist who is not a projectivist um, as for what i think of so what do I think of projectivism? I think that it's pretty plausible. Um, I, I guess it's one, I, I mean, yeah, like, uh, so an anti-realist will need to say something about why we make moral judgments and why many people are inclined to moral realism. I think that projectivism provides a fairly plausible explanation for uh, why people tend to have realist intuitions. Um, as for quasi-realism, I absolutely hate it. I see it as something that is tranquilizing an interesting position. Um, so I would say that Blackburn and the quasi-realists have done interesting work and important work in terms of answering things like the frege Geach problem. Um, but they go too far because what Blackburn and the other quasi-realists want to do is to save more realist intuitions, um, they don't just want to save the idea that we can engage in moral arguments. I mean, obviously we can engage in moral arguments and any meta-ethics needs to account for that. Insofar as non-cognitivism has difficulty um, like accounting for just the, the sort of everyday use of moral statements or it has difficulty accounting for the meaning of moral statements in embedded contexts, um, like that's a genuine problem. And quasi-realists have done good work in terms of answering that problem. But they go too far because they want to say, well, not only right, can we still you know, have meaningful moral statements, but we can also have moral truth. Right? We, can, we can say that certain moral claims are true and certain moral claims are false. And not only that, but maybe we can even talk of moral properties. Um, maybe we can even talk of moral facts. Um, so we can say things like, it is a fact that stealing is wrong. Um, or stealing has the property of wrongness. Um, Blackburn tries to vindicate all of this. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that I, I can't see the point of engaging in this. I think what I want to say is like, no, realism is just wrong, right? We shouldn't be trying to save the, the, these realist intuitions. We should just say realism is mistaken, right? And like, we should reject these intuitions um, insofar as people have them. Um, and yeah, I, as I say, it's just, it just seems to be taking a very interesting position, um, the anti-realist position, and then kind of tranquilizing it and making it safe for realists. Whereas I, like, fuck realists. Who cares what they think? Fuck them, right? <laughs> I have no interest in making my position safe for realists or inviting for realists, right? They are wrong. And <laughs> I am not going to tranquilize my views. Um, in order to satisfy their sentiments. And of course, it, it doesn't work because realists are not going to be satisfied with it anyway, right? Unless you, you buy into all of their metaphysical rubbish, they're not going to be satisfied with, uh, with, 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 um, with a quasi-realist position. But, you know, I, I don't like it. I don't like quasi-realism. That's not a very sophisticated argument, is it? But um, that's how I actually feel. Uh, Nominist asks, are you a nominalist? Uh, yeah, I don't think there are any abstract objects. Um, and with respect to kinds, um, well, I endorse a pretty firm um, nominalist position on kinds. I'm, I'm very much on the social constructivist side. I have a video called Classification and Kinds, an anti-realist view, which, you know, I'd like to think is, um, you know, fairly 
provides a, a, a sort of modern, sophisticated defense of a sort of nominalism. So um, go and go and check that out if you're interested. Um, Owners82 asks, is it rational to believe in the many worlds of the Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics due to the mathematical implications of the theory, even though we cannot observe the other worlds, or is it irrational because there is no empirical evidence for them? I have a very permissive conception of rationality. Um, so what I would say is that it's not, there's nothing necessarily irrational about believing in the Everettian many worlds. Um, I certainly don't think that it is rationally compelling. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, so it kind of depends on what you mean when you say, is it rational? Because it's certainly not rationally compelling. I mean, I'm not a scientific realist, uh, as, as you probably know. Um, uh, and I'm, even if I were a scientific realist, uh, I wouldn't buy into the many worlds interpretation because it seems to me that in order to get to uh, any particular interpretation of quantum mechanics, right, you need to make a whole host of controversial philosophical assumptions. I mean, I'm not sure, right, like, I'm not a physicist, but I am sure that there's, there's certainly no, cons no universal consensus among physicists on what the right interpretation of quantum mechanics is. And it seems to me um, that getting to any particular interpretation of quantum mechanics requires, you know, it requires drawing on a lot of controversial philosophical claims um, you know, it's not like, for instance, believing in electrons, say, right? Like, um, so somebody who is a scientific realist uh, of a more empiricist orientation, I think, can quite easily believe in electrons. Um, but getting to any particular interpretation of quantum mechanics is going to require more than that. So, OK, I don't think that it's rationally compelling. Um, but... Um, you know, I, I, I have a very permissive conception of rationality because I tend to think, you, you know, I think rationality really just comes down to a kind of success, right? So um, I think that I think of rationality um, as involving uh, a sort of coherence of one's beliefs and one's actions. And in particular, like a rational person is somebody who is able to you know um bring right their experiences of the world right in line with what they want their experiences of the world to be and they're able to you know apply methods that um will predict that are predictably um successful right in terms of you know bringing like in terms of getting what they want so um yeah, I I tend to look at rationality as, as like as long as you're able to do that, as long as your your you know beliefs and your actions are coherent, and as long as you are successful in your actions in a certain way, then I would say that's all that really matters for rationality. Now, if we imagine you know a scientist engaging in quantum theory and performing experiments, and you know maybe they're constructing instruments. Um, and they're developing the theory and like they're successful at this like let's imagine they're a good scientist and part of the way in which they're interacting with the world is with is via believing some particular interpretation of quantum mechanics well that's perfectly rational um, now of course you could say well they could do the same thing even if they believed a different interpretation of quantum mechanics or even if they were completely agnostic about the right interpretation of quantum mechanics. And I think that's true, right? Because there are plenty of successful scientists who endorse the Everett interpretation. There are plenty of successful scientists who endorse the Copenhagen interpretation. And there are plenty of successful scientists who say, I'm just going to be agnostic. Um, but but the point is, is, you know, if, if, if you see rationality um, in this more permissive way, right, um, then like all of those things can count as rational. Um, so I guess the, the, the way to put this is that I don't think that rationality um, kind of requires any specific beliefs, right? There's a whole host of different uh, beliefs one can hold in completely rational ways. Um, and I mean, certainly I would say that there's no good justification 
for <laughs> believing the Everett interpretation. But um, it's not necessarily irrational to believe things without uh, compelling justification in their favour, um, I guess is, is the, the way I, I would put this. Um, so I, I think that answers it. I mean, um, you ask, oh, you ask, is it irrational because there's no empirical evidence for them? No, I don't think that it's irrational to believe things beyond the empirical evidence. Um, I mean, I personally, being an empiricist, I, I tend to take empirical evidence as being a pretty strong constraint on what I'm prepared to believe. But it's not necessarily irrational, in my view, um, to believe things beyond the empirical evidence. Uh, again, as long as you have that coherence of belief and action in such a way that your actions are predictably, reliably successful, I'm going to count you as rational, even if you hold beliefs that I think are pretty silly. Uh, Orange Replier. Would you want to do another reading group at some point, maybe advertise to your channel to see if we can get more people than the Discord? Sure. I mean, if there's an interest in the reading groups, um, like, I'd be totally up for doing them. But it just seems, I don't know, when I did the first reading group, there was, like, literally only one person um, who, um, who participated. And that was on a, uh, a, a, an article that a lot of people had recommended. And it seemed like, I, I sort of said to people, hey, you know, do you want to do a reading group about this article? And... A lot of people said yes, but in the end, only one person turned up. And I don't know, maybe I chose the wrong time to do it. I did actually try to choose a time that would be OK for people both in the UK and in the US, because that's where most of my viewers are. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's fine. Like, I, you know, I mean, I can understand that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily want to, to do a reading group, but it's just it seemed that it didn't get much interest. So um, but hey, I mean, you know, if you want to do a reading group, like, or not even a group, I mean, if, if you want to just, like, come and talk about an article with me, we can totally do that. I mean, if you're prepared to have it, uh, like, uploaded onto, onto YouTube afterwards, like, we can, we can do that. I mean, just send me an email with, uh, what you want to talk about and when, and I'm happy to go ahead with it. Um, so, you know, um, and I'll, I, I don't know, I'll tr maybe try to set up a reading group, but um, yeah, as I say, there wasn't that much interest in it, so I don't know. Do you believe there is an epistemically significant difference between experiment and simulation? You know, my inclination on this, and I must say I haven't read a lot of the literature on simulation, but my inclination on this is just to say that simulation is a kind of experiment. Um, so, you know, when we want to draw conclusions about particular objects or processes, we will often study different objects and processes. Um, it's always been that way in science. So, you know, think about, uh, um, okay, um, let's think of a good example. Um, there's got to be a good example. I should have made some notes on it. Oh, so think of something like the hydraulic, um, the hydraulic scale model of the San Francisco Bay, okay? So is that a simulation or an experiment? Well, I mean, it's you, you, like, I mean, like in the case, it's not a computer simulation because it's an actual physical model, right? But we're constructing something else and then we're making extrapolations from it. It's a real physical object that we can per perform experiments on, but we're extrapolating from it um, in the same, I mean, is that fundamentally different from you know, constructing something digitally, constructing an object in a computer, and then perf extrapolating from that. I don't see why. Um, or think about, uh, you know, um, how physicists will perform experiments uh, using, I don't know, like Galileo, right, performed experiments on inclined planes in order to draw conclusions about objects in free fall. Obviously, if an object is on an inclined plane, that's not an object in free fall, right? So we're studying one type of process and then extrapolating and drawing conclusions about another type of process. In general, right, we extrapolate to how things behave in conditions beyond the experiment. So I think that simulation, I, my inclination is to say simulations are just kinds of experiments. Um, having said that, of course, they, there are differences. Um, but you know, you ask, is there an epistemically significant difference? I think the thing is, is that, like, why would there be a general answer to this? I mean, surely we have to look at the specific study in question, because there are many different kinds of experiments, many different kinds of simulations, 
There are different uses to which they are put. There are different kinds of conclusions that people are going to draw from them. I just don't know why there would be a general answer um, concerning the the epistemic differences between experiment and simulation. Like, and again, I, I haven't, I, I, as I said, I haven't read much of the literature on simulation, so I might be missing something really obvious here. But it seems my attitude would be surely. Uh, this just depends on the details of the study in question um, and that there isn't going to be a general answer. Um, question three, what do you find more plausible, semantic externalism or internalism? Why? Well, you know what? I don't care. Uh, this is a debate that really doesn't interest me. <laughs> I can say that the traditional arguments, you know, Putnam's Twin Earth, a lot of Kripke's work, I, I think they're all th th that stuff is all pretty ridiculous. Um, but I'm generally inclined to think that there's no fact of the matter um, when it comes to uh, meaning and the content of mental states. I think that these are just indeterminate. Um, and, you know, what we say about the meaning or about the content of mental states is really just, it's just a matter of what's useful in terms of like generating models of human behavior and human minds and so on. I, I really don't think there's a fact of the matter here. Um, so I would say I find neither plausible insofar as they are offered as claims about uh, what meaning or mental content actually consists in. Uh, uh, Patrick Wilson, could you give your thoughts on the companions in guilt argument? Would you classify yourself as an epistemic anti-realist? The companions in guilt argument, uh, I see it as an interesting challenge, but that's all. Um, I think that I've encountered a lot of realists online who are very smug about this argument and they seem to think that this just demolishes anti-realism and it doesn't. And frankly, I think if that's your attitude to the argument, you're going to feel pretty embarrassed in like 50 years time. Um, I see it as being kind of like um, Moore's open question argument, because when Moore made that argument, uh, a load of philosophers um, all thought that this just refutes moral naturalism. Like that's the end for meta-ethical naturalism. And they got very, very smug about it. Um, but today we understand that there are like a hundred ways that naturalists can answer Moore's open question argument. There are, there are lots and lots of responses to it. And it's an interesting challenge. Like it is, it is a challenge for someone who's a moral naturalist, um, but it, it doesn't, it's not a knockdown argument because you know what? There are no knockdown arguments in philosophy. There are no knockdown arguments in philosophy. So anybody who want, who's trying to present the companions and guilt argument as a knockdown argument against moral anti-realism, like that's um, I, I no that that's kind of embarrassing, right? Um, so my 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 take on the companions and guilt argument. Well, I am kind of happy to just call myself an epistemic anti-realist, um, but I'm making a concern there. I'm making a concession to the realist. I'm making the concession that epistemic judgments um, do in fact presuppose like categorical reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of, ha I'm happy to make that concession, um, but I think that you don't have to be, right? I think it is totally possible to be an epistemic realist and a moral anti-realist. Um, but, you know, okay, what, I, I call myself an epistemic anti-realist uh, because what I would say is, look, we can we can do all the work we need to do with non-normative evidential support relations and with the aims that people have with respect to belief formation. Um, so, uh, you know, like <laughs> I can give an argument to the effect that some proposition is true. And, you know, one of the aims that I have with respect to belief formation is believing things that are true. But if somebody just doesn't care about believing things that are true, then that argument will no longer constitute any reason for them to believe the proposition. Um, so, you know, if you want to say that epistemic judgments presuppose categorical normativity, then fine, I'm an epistemic anti-realist. Um, but I actually, like, yeah, again, I, 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 I think that, um, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to be uh, an epistemic anti-realist to answer this argument. I, I would also say I think it is easier to uh, understand categorical reasons for belief than categorical reasons for action. So, I mean, it's, uh, categorical reasons, recall, are desire-independent reasons. Um, now, if we think about the case of belief, right, 
here's what I think is a fairly plausible story. Beliefs just kind of necessarily, right, by definition, aim at the truth. Um, or maybe we wouldn't even have to say that that's what they do by definition, but like maybe we could say that's the uh, the kind of functional role of belief or something like that. I mean, certainly that seems to be why beliefs evolved, um, why we have the capacity to believe things. Organisms need to represent their environments with reasonable degrees of accuracy in certain respects. Um, and furthermore, it would just be really weird for somebody to say something like, X isn't true, but I believe X, right? Like, I mean, it, that would make no sense almost. I mean, it's like the idea of somebody believing X, even though X isn't true, is not logically contradictory. But if an individual were to accept that something isn't true, but also they believe it, that would just be really strange. Um, you know, so this is why the case of someone who uh, believes that the earth is flat just because they want to, you know, just because they don't care about truth. That seems so bizarre. Um, so an argument to the effect that some proposition is true is an argument for believing the proposition, right? It's a reason for believing the proposition, and that's the case regardless of what your desires are. So that constitutes a categorical reason for belief. Now, think instead about categorical reasons for action, um, reasons for action that obtain regardless of your desires. Well, Action doesn't like, you know, so I've said that like beliefs kind of aim at truth. Action doesn't aim at anything in particular. Action doesn't aim, for instance, to be other regarding, right? I mean, actions can be entirely self-regarding and that's totally coherent. Um, nothing in the nature of action itself uh, makes it so that actions aim to be moral. Um, indeed, people often act immorally uh, and, you know, people act in ways that they themselves take to be immoral or that they themselves take to be selfish. So whereas in the case of belief, it seems like beliefs just aim at the truth, actions don't seem to aim at anything in particular. And so in the case of belief, um, it seems to me to be more easy to understand the idea of categorical reasons for belief. Um, whereas like categorical reasons for action um, just seem bizarre. So there's there's another like way in which you know you could be an epistemic realist, but a oh, well I don't know whether that would necessarily be epistemic realism, but that's a distinction, right? A distinction between reasons for belief and reasons for action. And I mean, putting all of this aside, um, there are problems with uh, moral norms beyond categorical normativity, right? So um, the companions and Gill argument, right? It points so I've you know, as an anti-realist, you know, I may make this argument that it's difficult to understand what it could mean to say that there are categorical reasons for action. And then the companions in guilt argument will be, well, you know, it turns out that, that, that there are also, we want to say that there are categorical reasons in the epistemic domain as well. Um, so if there's a problem with categorical reasons, uh, then, you know, you're going to be committed to epistemic anti-realism, which is an absurd conclusion. But the thing is, is that there are lots of other reasons to be a moral anti-realist, right? Like, even if I were to accept categorical reasons, uh, even if I were to accept that they were legitimate, I wouldn't become a moral realist because there's a load of other problems <laughs> with the idea of moral norms. So um, one problem is uh, it seems like we can give evolutionary debunking arguments um, or um, I just, I guess, general debunking arguments, they wouldn't necessarily have to be evolutionary ones, but we can give debunking arguments with respect to morality a lot more straightforwardly than we can with respect to epistemic norms. So we can say something like, well, moral judgments arose because they promoted cooperation, um, because they improved survival and reproduction, not because they tracked moral truths. Um, epistemic judgments arose because, what, because, you know, they, well, I mean, okay, let's say epistemic judgments arose somehow because they promote, promoted uh, uh, survival and reproduction, not because they tracked epistemic truths. But then it's not, I mean, so like, it's not clear um, how that argument would, would run, right? Like it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how a kind of debunking argument, um, if that would be so plausible in the epistemic case. Uh, like there have been people who have, I guess, tried to make what we might think of as epistemic debunking arguments. Like I'm thinking of something like Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism, but I think that's a lot less plausible 
than the uh, evolutionary debunking arguments against um, morality. So uh, yeah, that's that's one thing. Also, I think we can point to the different roles of epistemic norms and moral norms. So we apply epistemic norms in the construction of theories that we use to make predictions, um, which are then tested. You know, so um, you know we apply epistemic norms when we're doing science and we also apply epistemic norms just in our daily lives in like means end reasoning and we again will in a much less sophisticated way but we will still derive predictions and in a sense test those predictions you know when I um, kind of make uh, 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 predictions about you know what an how another person will act or where another person will be um, you know again those predictions are kind of tested they're, they're either going to turn out to be true or false um, so the point is, is that we apply epistemic norms in the construction of theories. Now, when predictions fail, we can reject not just the theories, but also the norms governing uh, theory construction. So consider, for instance, the norm of mechanistic explanation, right? This was uh, popular in the early modern period, right? There was just a general constraint that scientific theories were supposed to uh, provide mechanistic explanations in the sense that they were um, supposed to show like how things pushed and pulled each other. Um, the general view was, you know, a world of corpuscules in the void and any acceptable scientific theory um, had to show how like forces were products of things banging into each other, you know. And then that was abandoned with the enormous success of Newtonian mechanics, right? Newtonian mechanics just treats uh, gravity as a kind of occult force. Uh, at least that's how it was seen at the time. But hey, it's incredibly successful. Um, so it turns out that this uh, norm of mechanistic explanation isn't so important after all. Or think about the different conceptions of simplicity, you know, and how norms of um, simplicity change with changing theories. So um, epistemic norms are very closely connected to theory construction and they are in a way kind of brought against the tribunal of experience in the same way as um, the rest of the theory is. Uh, whereas moral norms don't seem to be playing an analogous role. Um, I mean, moral norms will play some role in theory construction and theory testing, but in a much, it's it's less sort of, so like, I'm, I, I mean, I guess you might, for instance, um, you know, use moral judgments insofar as you you say well um if we're doing uh, i don't know testing in a medical context right like if we want to test the efficacy of a drug then we are going to have much higher standards right um for accepting a particular claim in a medical context than we might accept in some other context because you know this might so maybe that's kind of a moral norm but obviously that's not really got so much to do with the theory testing that's more just um, the conditions under which we uh, uh, would like accept that theory and put it into practice. So um, yeah, I think there are a host of differences between moral norms and epistemic norms. Um, <laughs> so I think the companions and guilt argument just kind of fails on every level because I'm totally happy to just be an, an epistemic anti-realist. Um, but I also think that um, actually we can understand the idea of categorical reasons for belief easier than we can understand categorical reasons for action. I also think there are lots and lots of differences between moral norms and epistemic norms, so that even if we were to say that uh, categorical reasons um, are perfectly legitimate, that would not in any way you know, commit us to moral realism. Um, there are lots and lots of responses to this argument. Okay. Uh, Pedro Paramo uh, asks, what are your thoughts on Heidegger and phenomenology as a whole? I have no opinion on Heidegger. Uh, I read him once, absolutely hated it, thought it was shit. And uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I didn't really understand it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have any opinion. Uh, phenomenology. I feel like my view on phenomenology is very naive. Um, I've said this a few times. And I've said this to people who know phenomenology, and I've never actually received an, a satisfactory answer to this. I assume that there must be a satisfactory answer, um, but no one has ever told me what it is. So um, if you know phenomenology, maybe you can tell me what the satisfactory answer to this is. 
So here's, here's the problem. So my understanding is, first of all, the basic idea of phenomenology is that we are trying to understand the um, structures of experience or structures of consciousness from a first person point of view. I think that's the basic idea. Now, my position is we just have no reliable access to that. So I can tell you about, like I'm looking right now at a cup, okay? I can tell you about a cup and I can tell you about the properties of the cup and I can check my claims um, against the observations that other people make. Now, what can I say about my experience of the cup? Um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, like, certainly I'm not sure how I would, you know, check the claims I make. Like, it's not publicly verifiable or publicly checkable in the same way as if I say, you know, the cup is white, right? Well, that's something that other people can look at and they can check and they can, you know, potentially correct my judgment. Whereas if I make a claim about my experience of the cup, that's that seems a lot more obscure to me. Um, so here's... Uh, I guess a specific example, right, um, to may, maybe illustrate what, what the problem is. <clears throat> um, right now, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the cup, so obviously I'm consciously aware of it. But here's a question. Um, when I'm sitting here, right, and the cup is in my peripheral vision, am I always consciously aware of the cup? Or am I only consciously aware of the cup when I'm directing my attention to it? So, you know, five minutes ago, before I'd, like, before I'd directed my attention to this cup, before I'd intentionally thought about it and started talking about it, was I consciously aware of it? I mean, it was in my peripheral vision, right? At some level, my brain must have been, you know, doing something that would have, you know, acknowledged it, let's say, but, or detected it. But was that part of my experience? So the general question is, right, does my experience um, contain everything that I could draw my attention to, right? Um, or am I only experiencing uh, the things that I'm actually drawing my attention to? Um, like, wh which of those? Which of those is right? How do we even begin to answer that question? I I have no idea, and that seems like a really basic question about experience. I mean, that's so, so this is like not a, a particularly arcane question, right? Um, so, yeah, is, is, is experience your experience of the world such that you are uh, consciously aware of like loads and loads of stuff? Um, it's just that you're not directing your attention to it, right? Or is it the case that you're generally only consciously aware of that which you are directing your attention to? Um, I don't know how you go about answering this. And I, I can say that... Um, I think that Eric Schwitzgebel has done a little bit of empirical work uh, asking for people's intuitions on this. And people give different answers, right? So some people think, uh, some people have the intuition that experience is like rich, that it consists of l like loads of stuff that you're not directing your attention to. Other people think that no, you only experience the things that you actually direct your attention to. And I just, it doesn't seem like there's any real way of resolving this question. And that's a really basic question about experience. If we can't even get that, then I mean, I don't know how we can get anything. Um, I can also say that, you know, this isn't just a, a, a sort of philosophical point. Um, historically, there was a movement in psychology called introspectionist psychology. And the introspectionist psychologists tried to describe experiences from a first person point of view and they tried to do it in a scientific way so they would control the environment very carefully and then they would create um so they'd, they'd have fixed environmental conditions and then they would create some conscious events so they might like flash a light and create an after image and then they would describe in great detail what the after image was like so just again from the first person like conscious experience point of view introspectionist psychology failed because different schools described their experience in completely different ways and there was no way of deciding who was right. I mean there's just nothing because we're just talking about it from a first person point of view. So it came across as though you know what, the, 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 what seemed to be happening is that people were kind of m constructing fictions rather than getting at the facts of what experience was like. Um, in general it seems like you know, there has to be evidence that is publicly accessible and publicly checkable. 
And I mean, that ultimately, you know, led to the rise of behaviorism, which I mean, may have been too strict about postulating inner uh, mental events. But even so, um, the basic idea that like we just have there's no reliable way of describing experience from a first person point of view. I find that pretty persuasive. And I, I don't know how we even get phenomenology off the ground, um, given this this problem. But maybe it isn't a problem. Maybe I'm just missing something obvious. But like no one's I mean, I've spoken to people who do phenomenology and I'm like, tell me uh, how you solve this problem. And I can tell you that when I asked this to one of my lecturers at university at the time um, who was teaching us phenomenology, um, she actually just accepted that phenomenologists aren't really trying to describe facts. I mean, when I said, you know, it seems like you're just constructing a fiction or a narrative, she was like, she, she pretty much just said, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. Um, which, um, I mean, if you want to do that, fine, but I, I don't know why you would call it philosophy. I mean, that seems like, you know, you're just writing stories. So, uh, I, I yeah, um, those are my thoughts on phenomenology. That's maybe very, very naive, but that's what I got to say about it. Okay, Phil Books says, do you like ContraPoints and Philosophy Tube's content? I've never actually watched anything from Philosophy Tube as far as I can recall. So I, I don't think I have. Anyway, um, as for ContraPoints, I like ContraPoints well enough. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, that certainly videos are very impressive from an aesthetic point of view. Um, uh, and I'm uh, yeah, I quite like some of the arguments that she makes. Uh, I have to say, I think the more recent videos aren't quite so much to my taste because she seems to have the more recent videos, at least the ones that I've seen, seem to be a lot more just kind of personal. I mean, they're they're dealing with like just her personal experiences of of um, you know emotions. Um, what was the, there was one on like shame or something. I, or cringe, I think. There was a cringe one, and then there was, was there one on shame? Um, they just seemed like, yeah, uh, they're, they're not topics that I'm that interested in, really. Um, and also, her videos have gotten very, very long. Um, I, I, uh, which I think that, like, yeah, uh, maybe an editor would be, maybe some editing down would, would make it more appealing to me. Um, but, you know, um, she's also got videos on, um, I really liked the one, is it called Are, Are Traps Gay? I liked that one a lot. Uh, I thought she made some really good points there. So uh, is that what it was called? I forget if that was actually the name of it. She was definitely talking about that question, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that was a good video. So um, I feel like that, that video might actually have been called Pronouns. <laughs> But you see, because that's kind of less, that's less about like just like personal emotion and stuff. And that's more about a general uh, social phenomenon. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, so I like some of the some of her stuff. Um, some of it's less to my taste. But, you know, that's that's cool. Different people are into different things. Um, what was the last book, book you read? When Maps Become the World by uh, by Rasmus Winther. Do you think of philosophy as a recreational activity? Not really, because it's literally my work. But then again, I do, uh, I do it in my free time. So um, maybe it, maybe it is a recreational activity. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I take it very seriously. Like I, even when I'm doing it in my free time, I read articles and I, you know, write arguments and I do the same sort of thing I do when I'm doing my work. But um, um, yeah, I think uh, it's just something I thoroughly enjoy. Um, so I, if you want to call that a recreational activity, go ahead. You also ask, are we free to interpret a social reality and is philosophy necessary only to clarify the worldview? But to be honest, I don't actually understand what those questions mean. So um, I can't answer them. Phil Physics asks, Friedrich Nietzsche, what are your takes? Uh, figures or philosophies you think are inferior, superior, uh, I find Fritz is spot on about everything, even things he says that are culturally dated are easily covered by his views. Um, a long, long, long time ago, I tried reading Beyond Good and Evil um, and uh, the Zarathustra, Thus Spake, thus spake Zarathustra, uh, and I, I hated them. Um, uh, I, I, I think I got um, about a quarter of the way into both of them before I tried throwing the book out the window. Um, 
I don't have any particular opinion on Nietzsche's views because I don't know much about him. I'm told by my friend Cole that he was heavily influenced by Max Stirner. Now, I absolutely love Stirner. Um, so, you know, insofar as Nietzsche has the same sort of positions that Stirner had, I guess I, I would like him. But um, unfortunately, I just find I can't get on with the, the style of writing. Um, political junkie, junkie, what is your response to companions and guilt arguments? Uh, oh, OK, I've, I've already... I've already answered that question, um, so I'll link you to that. Prenuptials. What are your thoughts on sociobiology, specifically social scientists like Sperber and Tomasello, who try to integrate the ontology of biology into psychology and cultural anthropology? I actually, I don't know that, know about that work, so um, I can't say anything about that. You know, so, sociobiology and evolutionary psychology in general, I, I find myself, like, just, I, I don't really have an opinion on it. I mean, um... There are a lot of criticisms of evolutionary psychology, which, from my point of view, are just irrelevant. So, like the arguments against the existence of mental modules, for instance, um, from an instrumentalist point of view, which is the point of view I take towards the sciences, it just doesn't matter whether or not those things exist. Um, the question is just whether or not we can build predictive, useful predictive models um, which you know postulate these things as part of the, as part of the model. Um, now, I mean, there are certainly good arguments uh, against the predictive value of evolutionary psychology, but you know, just because I mean, uh, look, this is a a common point that's made by I think many philosophers of science. Um, you know, just because a research tradition does not yet have um, a lot of is not yet uh, progressive uh, in Lakato as Lakatos might say, you know, it's it can become progressive in in the future. It uh, uh, there are there are, I think, some successes of evolutionary psychology. I mean, there are a lot of failures, but there are some successes. And um, like at least prima facie, it makes perfect sense that evolution, insofar as uh, you know, we can talk about various biological traits as being a product of evolution, it's not like crazy to think that the same might be true of the mind. I mean, minds are products of evolution. So I don't have in principle any objection to this as a scientific field. Now, in practice, there are plenty of problems with evolutionary psychology, uh, with particular studies, right, and some of the particular conclusions that people have drawn. But I don't have any objection to it in principle. Um, I don't know how I, like, how could I have an objection to it in principle? Uh, you know, um, again, for me, it's it's just a matter of will we be able to, you know, use these theories to construct useful predictive models? And I, I can't rule out the possibility of that happening in evolutionary psychology. In fact, there are cases where that, you know, already has happened. So um, beyond that, I I really don't have, any strong opinion on it. You know, I'm, I'm happy to just uh, defer this to the uh, biologists and psychologists and social scientists. Um, um, yeah. What are your thoughts, if any, uh, on crypto-anarchism influenced movements that are going on in Taiwan, Barcelona, Argentina? Well, I don't have any thoughts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really know much about it. Um, in general, my engagement with political philosophy is very much on the level of what we might call ideal theory. So, um, you know, there's a, I, I think that certainly in philosophy, you know, we make this distinction between like ideal theory and non-ideal theory when doing political philosophy. I mean, um, I guess the non-ideal approach will be much more kind of practical and it will look at like actually existing political systems and you know try to understand them try to understand how to improve them um whereas the ideal approach is well you know it's people more like rules and nozick and uh you know just trying to figure out okay what would the uh, ideal society look like and um, once we've figured out what an ideal society looks like, well, it's up to other people to figure out what sort of circumstances would best realise these ideals. You know, leave that to the economists and social scientists and so on to figure out how best to realise these ideals. The thing is, I mean, I just don't know much about what's going on in the real world. 
Um, so insofar as I engage with political philosophy, it is very much on um, the level of ideal theory. Um, uh, and I, I mean, you know, maybe that's kind of a waste of time. Um, I suppose that it doesn't really fit very nicely with my increasingly sort of practical pragmatist orientation in other contexts. I, I, I am aware that there is a kind of incoherence, at least in the methods and or at least the, the, the in my worldview, I guess, in the way that I'm approaching these different topics. But, you know, um, that's that's just the way it is. So, yeah, I don't know about this uh, stuff and therefore have no thoughts on it. Q nothing. What is your opinion about genetic slash biological determinism? Well, I mean, if you were to claim that um, there are traits which are caused by genes alone, that is obviously false. Absolutely nobody accepts that. That's not true for any trait whatsoever. There is always, every trait is a product of interaction between genes and environment. So, you know, if that's what ge genetic determinism means, then it's just obviously false. If on the other hand, the claim is just that there is some variation in traits which is correlated to genetic variation in a way which is relatively insensitive to environmental changes, that is obviously true. Um, but then why would you call that genetic determinism? Um, you know, uh, uh, so I think that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, Rain, to what extent do you personally think that distinctions need to be made pragmatically as opposed to precisely? For example, suppose that science somehow proves the direct and complete connection between physics and conscious phenomena such that there is no element of conscious experience that isn't fully reducible uh, by the laws of physics. Should the mental versus physical distinctions still then be made? Um, on the one hand, the two seem very different and therefore worthy of distinguishing between. On the other hand, there is no non-arbitrary distinction between them. Um, I would have thought in this situation, wouldn't we just say that the distinction has been preserved in physics? So, I mean, if we're assuming that, you know, the mind is a product of the brain and that physics tells us everything there is to know about the brain, then presumably there's, you know, insofar as we draw distinctions between minds and non-minds, or insofar as we draw distinctions between different um, types of mental processes and so on, those, there, if we were to reduce this entirely to physics, if there was to be a straightforward reduction to physics, right, then we would be drawing, we would be able to draw the same distinction in physical terms, wouldn't we? Because if we're not able to draw that distinction, then it looks like what we're talking about is not reduction, but elimination, okay? So if it, like, you know, if we're saying that, um, like, there's no way of kind of capturing certain distinctions uh, within physics, right, um, but we're saying like physics is all there is, uh, then, then you've got an eliminativist position. But if you're saying that that our theory of the mind is fully reducible to the laws of physics, then it looks like you're just going to have some way of capturing the distinctions that our theory of the mind draws in physical terms. So I, I find this a, a bit, I, I don't know, I'm a bit confused by the question, I, I guess. Um, as to the general idea of, of drawing distinctions pragmatically, though, yeah, I'm, I'm like all in favor of that uh and i i mean i do think that that's kind of what we do with the mind right like i uh i think that um insofar as we talk about like beliefs and desires we are engaging in a useful simplification um we are faced with uh, this enormously complex set of phenomena uh you know human behavior and uh, internal mental states and we need to come up with some relatively simple theory that we can use to, you know, predict and explain what people do and what sort of mental states we have and so on. Um, and, um, you know, we, we just have a, a, a kind of quick and dirty system, um, a quick and dirty, like, set of classifications that we can apply that help us do that. Um, when we talk about things like desires obviously the concept of desire covers a whole host of different things um it's not really clear that like the desire for a chocolate cake is i mean it's it, it's certainly very different um from say my desire to become a philosopher right there are on, on certainly on the level of the brain there would be completely different things going on presumably right so the desire for the chocolate cake would uh involve the operation 
of totally different things from my desire to become a philosopher. So, you know, uh, I think that these distinctions are made pragmatically. Um, but uh, even so, if, if, if you're reducing it to physics, then there would, I mean, if it's, if it's fully reducible, then that would imply to me that the same distinctions can be captured in one way or another, or can be recovered in one way or another from the physics. Um, Rob Engelbright says, would you rather fight one horse-sized Wittgensteins or a hundred duck-sized Wittgensteins? I, I would love to, you know, fight a hundred duck-sized Wittgensteins. That, that, that sounds uh, enormously amusing. So um, I, would, I would do that. Um, <clears throat> Robert Anton, capitalism versus communism, what's worse? I have no idea how to answer that question. Um, like, I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin with that. So, okay. Let's do, so communism, right? What communism covers so many things, man. I mean, you've got the actually existing primitive communism of hunter-gatherer societies, right? You've got the communist states, uh, or the so-called communist states, right? Like the USSR. But like, oh, by the way, a lot of people are going to question whether they are actually communist, and a lot of people will question whether hunter-gatherer societies are actually communist. Um, do we really want to call them communist or uh, like whatever? Then you've got the uh, anarchist communities who seized factories and set up communes during the Spanish Revolution. Um, but maybe they weren't really communists either. Then there's communism as a political ideal, you know, classless, stateless society, common ownership of the means of production, all of that. So um, what, what am I comparing against what here? Obviously, the same kind of problems arise if we're talking about capitalism, right? Um, so I, like, I don't know. Some people will use the term capitalism to just mean free markets, right? But if you use the term capitalism in that sense, then it turns out that there's a bunch of left-wing market anarchists who are capitalists. Um, yeah, so, uh, 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 you know, maybe we shouldn't just use the term in that sense. Um, uh, we probably want to use it a bit more precisely to describe particular systems of like property rights and wealth ownership and, and so on. And I mean, I don't even know where to begin with this question. Uh, so I'm going to have to just move on. Um, right. <clears throat> Ryan Hauger, do you have any advice for a philosophy undergraduate who wants to get a PhD one day? Um, I would say uh, only do a philosophy PhD under the following conditions. Number one, you really love philosophy. Because if you're doing a philosophy PhD, then you're going to need to spend all of your time doing philosophy. Um, so if you're happy to spend all of your time doing philosophy, then that's great. You know, you will enjoy doing a philosophy PhD. But you need to like just bear in mind that if you pursue a philosophy PhD, right, you are going to be spending all of your time doing philosophy. So uh, second, you should only do it if you are uh, either independently wealthy uh, or you can get funding, right? Do not under any circumstances pay for this yourself. Oh, well, I mean, look, man, I'm not going to tell you what to do, right? But like, it, it would be, I think, probably unwise um, to do this uh, if you, if, unless you're independently wealthy or you can get funding for it. I think it, it would probably be unwise um, just based on the kind of desires that most people have and the kind of things that most people want from their lives right? Um, third, you should only do it if you go into it without any expectation of having an academic career, right? Just do it for its own sake, okay? You, you have to actually want to do it just because you enjoy it and just because you want to do it for its own sake. Because if you do it expecting to get an academic career, there's a good chance you'll be disappointed because the job market is really shit and it's probably not going to get that much better. So there is a very good chance that you will fail to get an academic career. Um, so I think as long as you keep those three things in mind, right? So you have to really love philosophy. You have to be prepared to spend all your time doing philosophy. Um, you have to be independently wealthy or get funding. And you have to bear in mind that this might just go nowhere. Um, if you're happy with all of that, then do a philosophy PhD. If not, think of something else to do. Um, Rindika, uh, where do you read? Like the bed, a couch, a kitchen table, park bench, etc. Uh, well, I mean all of those places. Um, because I do a lot of reading and so I have to read whenever I get the chance but mostly it's on the computer most of the time because it's all you know most of what I read is online I read articles I read books that are available online so that is where I do most of my reading S. Cole what are your politics 
um, some sort of anarchism, but I'm still working it out. But I'm, I mean, I've always, always been uh, strongly libertarian of one sort or another, right? Right now, I'm pretty firmly in the more left libertarian uh, side, but um, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'd be happy to just identify as an anarchist, but I um, am un, unsure uh, exactly what brand of anarchism, but maybe that doesn't really matter anyway. I mean, um, I, can, I can say that, yeah, I've, I've always been extremely individualistic, extremely anti-authoritarian, um, and I mean, it's really just a matter of working out which system best uh, accommodates those values. Sally asks, uh, considering your knowledge of uh, philosophy of knowledge, do you think it's likely that we will meet aliens at some point in the future and be able to understand them? Will they have their own perception problems and probably they will have their own philosophy stemming from those and developing into some bizarre directions? Or could it be that our philosophy is bizarre? Could we understand aliens not just in language terms, but in philosophy terms? <clears throat> um, okay, first of all, will we meet intelligent aliens? Um, I mean, my inclination is that that is extremely unlikely. Uh, I tend to think, and I'm, I'm not sure I really have a good justification for this, but if somebody asked me to bet, my bet would be that intelligent life is extraordinarily rare. Um, I'm not entirely sure why I think that, but um, I mean, look, maybe life in general is very prevalent, right? Life microbial life might exist everywhere, but it just seems to me that like the steps required to get to uh, intelligent life, uh, it requires such specific conditions and it maybe requires things that are, um, you know, just sort of, it requires just kind of such good luck. Um, you know, things on our planet just happen to work out right such that intelligent civilization emerged. And then even once intelligent civilization emerges, I don't see any reason to expect that it actually will survive for very long. I mean, I'm pretty pessimistic, quite frankly, about the future of uh, our civilization. I don't see technological civilization uh, surviving very long into the future. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's very rare, and that when it does come, when it does emerge, um, it tends to uh, be snuffed out pretty quickly. Um, if I had to bet, that's what I would say. Um, in terms of uh, communicating with aliens, understanding aliens, I mean, well. You know, alien biology, alien culture, their history, their environment, um, you know, the way they think about things could be radically different. Uh, they, they may have developed language and thought completely differently um, or or maybe not. Right. It could be the case that uh, that there tends to be just sort of one or at least a, a very small set of ways of solving the kind of problems we have to solve in order for like intelligence or in order for the conditions required for technological civilization to emerge. So it might be the case that actually aliens think quite similarly to us. I don't know, I'm, I'm agnostic about that. Um, with respect to the question of philosophical problems, you know, it could be the case that what to us are very difficult philosophical problems would be sort of trivial to other societies. Um, you know, if, if there are certain philosophical problems that arise due to our cognitive limitations, maybe aliens would have no difficulty, um, I don't know, understanding the nature of consciousness or something like that. But I, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic about this because I'm agnostic about uh, what alien minds would be like. And so, you know, without knowing what alien minds would be like, it's very difficult to say anything about what their... Uh, philosophy would be like. I mean, even among human societies, the kind of philosophical questions that have occupied humans are sometimes very different in different societies. So who can say what aliens would be like? Uh, Sheikh Abra Hussein asks, is it really necessary to start with the Greeks? Um, no, I think that's actually a bad idea. Um, frankly, I think even if you're interested primarily in the Greeks, it's a bad idea to start with them. I would recommend starting with uh, introductory material. Um, so essentially you want to pick up an introduction um, that is relatively modern. So even if you've decided that your main interest is ancient Greek philosophy and that's what you want to pursue, I would recommend picking up a modern introduction. And the reason for that is simply that, <clears throat> you know, if you come to a 
philosophy text, um, it's any philosophy text is going to be presupposing like a lot of background. You know, philosophy is basically one long conversation and yeah, any philosophy text you read will be presupposing knowledge of the, re of the previous uh, elements of the conversation, um, the kinds of terms that are used, the kinds of problems that um, particular philosophers are dealing with. Like you need to have an understanding of the context in order to get what they're doing. So I think starting by reading the Greeks is a bad idea. You should always start with introductions. Um, and when it comes to just learning philosophy in general, I, I don't think we even need to care about the Greeks anymore. I, I actually don't think, I, I, honestly, I did read Plato, I had to uh, in my degree, I don't think it was necessary. Um, I think that the time would have been better spent doing other things, at least given what my personal interests were. Um, I, yeah, I, I, um, I think that if you happen to be interested in the history of philosophy, then it's worthwhile, but if not, uh, uh, do something else. Ah, just had to come downstairs because uh, people are sleeping. Uh, so, let's continue. Um, thoughts on the Kalam cosmological argument? Well, I would say there is just no reason whatsoever to believe that, the, uh, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Um, uh, I, yeah, um, I think it's entirely plausible that the universe just popped into existence. Um, there may well be things in the universe that just pop into existence without a cause as well, but I mean, there's no evidence of that, uh, at least no compelling evidence of that. But yeah, I mean, the universe itself um, could have just popped into existence. I should also say that um, it could be the case that, the, that there are, let's say, uh, reasons or grounds for the existence of the universe, even if these are not causal. Um, so uh, one kind of argument here would be, well, look, there are an infinite number of ways for there to have been something. Um, there's only one way for there to have been nothing. Uh, so it's like prima facie not surprising that something exists, that something just came into existence. Um, so, you know, you can, you can give uh, reasons or grounds for the existence of the universe without appealing to uh, uh, causal relations. But um, yeah, just generally the assumption that everything that begins to exist has a cause, uh, that I just have no reason to accept that. And even if I had some reason to accept that, um, that would only legitimately apply to things within the universe. Um, I think that, so the, the universe uh, is, you know, operates in a particular way, governed by particular laws. There's no reason to uh, extend principles that hold within the universe to the creation of the universe itself. Um, so, uh, the claim that whatever begins to exist has a cause of its existence, I don't accept. Um, what about the claim that the universe began to exist? Uh, well, I don't accept that either. Um, it may have existed forever in one form or another. It may have emerged from a multiverse which has existed forever. You know, so something or other may have just existed forever. I think that's totally plausible. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I think the argument just just fails. Um, also, even if I did accept the argument in, in, in at least its bare bones, I mean, there's no reason to believe that the uh, that if there is some timeless, uh, eternal, immaterial cause of the existence of the universe, that this resembles God in any way. Now, I do understand that, you know, the Kalam cosmological argument is one plank right, in a set of arguments for God, but it's just worth bearing, you know, it's always worth bearing that in mind. Like, even if you could establish that there is some entity, you know, some timeless, immaterial, uh, 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 eternal entity that brought the universe into existence, um, you are still a very, very, very long way away from establishing the existence of God, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Favourite philosophy book, uh, Against Method, by Paul Firebend. Shentifia, what do you think of the law of impermanence from Buddhist philosophy? How plausible is it to you? I don't know what that is. I don't know Buddhist philosophy. Sun Won Dao, thoughts on Hegel. I do not have any thoughts on Hegel. I do not know Hegel. Stefan Travis, uh, ah, yeah, your question about free will. Um, I have answered that earlier, so I will put a 
little thing on the description uh, to direct you to where that answer is. The mathematician, I want to start reading philosophy. Where do I start? This is a difficult question to answer because it does depend on what your interests are. I mean, if there are specific areas, then I could give more precise recommendations. But I think if you're just looking for a, you know, just general uh, uh, introduction to philosophy, um, Think by Simon Blackburn and Philosophy the Basics by Nigel Warburton are probably good places to start. Um, those are just general philosophy introductions. Um, I mean, yeah, just go 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 with those. Uh, again, if if there was something more specific, then um, like they might not be so good. But if it's just philosophy in general that you want to get started on, I think those would be good places to go. Uh, Tashu asks, what do I think of Hannah Arendt? Um, I do not know anything about Hannah Arendt, um, so I, uh, I can't say anything about her. Um, Tashu also adds that she wrote a lot about human judgment and how the crimes of the Nazis could be explained by an unwillingness to judge and think by themselves and a great willingness to follow a leader uncritically. Um, okay, I mean, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds pretty good, but unfortunately I... Um, have no comment because I don't know her work. Uh, <clears throat> Zob Dreisestig asks, favourite decision theory? So I think, um, man, I feel like I don't really know enough about decision theory to, to say anything here. I am inclined towards a kind of some sort of evidential decision theory. And the reason for this is I'm not a realist about causality. Um, so I would say, well, I'm not sure I would say this, but my inclination is to say that the fact that it is rational to do A in order to achieve B is what makes it assertable that A causes B. Um, so I'd actually say that causal decision theory, right, when you understand causality in this way, actually does deliver the right answers, but those answers are equivalent to what evidential decision theory delivers and causal decision theory delivers the right answers for the reasons that evidential decision theory delivers the right answers. Um, so, for example, on causal de decision theory, it turns out if, you're, if, you're ta if you take this kind of strongly anti-realist stance on causality, it's going to turn out that one boxing actually does cause the predictor to put the million pound uh, in the box. Um, and that's because one boxing is an effective strategy for bringing it about that there is a million pound in the box. Um, there's a very good paper on this point by uh, Hugh Price and somebody else called Clickbait for Causalists. <clears throat> um, so because I sort of have this, yeah, so because I have this, this anti-realist take on the nature of causality, I, um, I kind of can't, I, I don't see, you know, causal relations. Uh, I, I can't see uh, it, it being the case that rational action um, tracks objective causal relations because I think well there aren't objective causal relations and the uh, what makes certain causal relations assertable is dependent on what we take rational action to be so um, yeah I, uh, I, I that's that's my own the way I'm trending although I recognize that's an extremely controversial position and one which I'm not actually capable at this point of really defending properly so putting aside uh, controversial claims about causality um, you know what my my take is that rationality is a matter of, of success. It's a matter of what works. And one boxers are more successful. Um, you know, I am pretty inclined to accept the, uh, the point that, you know, if you're so rational, why ain't you rich? Now, two boxers will, of course, make the point that, well, sometimes irrationality is rewarded. You know, sometimes people play the lottery and they win. What I... What I really struggle to get on board with is the idea that irrationality is regularly predictably rewarded. Um, like that's where I really, that's what bothers me. I, I can't accept that, you know, like, because I'm not just rich. Here's the thing. It's not just that I'm rich. I'm predictably rich. Like, and you would bet that I would become rich, uh, <laughs> given that you know that I'm inclined to one box. Um, you know, rationality isn't a matter of blindly following principles. It's just a matter of figuring out what works in practice. And um, so, uh, uh, 
Yeah, I, I'd also add as well. I mean, I've I've sort of talked about Newcomb's problem here because that happens to be the you know the topic that I know the most about when it comes to decision theory. But I think that, that a lot of the cases that are used against evidential decision theory, it seems to me that they like you know like so the case of the um, what's it it's a case where it's something like oh well uh, we've discovered a gene which um, both causes lung cancer um, sorry a gene which causes people to smoke right and causes lung cancer and it also causes uh, people to want to read philosophy let's say so you know like 99 percent of the people who read philosophy uh, end up getting lung cancer that kind of thing regardless of whether it's yeah you know those kinds of cases i tend to think that those kinds of cases that are used against evidential decision theory rely on um assuming that we're calculating utilities in very naive ways but um i i also think that i'm not really familiar enough with the decision theory literature to actually take any to take a stance on this that's too strong um but hopefully that answers the question um when belief dies asks what's with the hair uh i don't know i've just always had long hair um don't know why just always liked it <clears throat> i say i always have that's actually not true uh i started growing my hair when i was about 12. so uh before then i did not have long hair um wisdom file if you could travel in the tardis with one doctor and one philosopher which doctor and which philosopher would you want to travel with? Oh, which doctor would I be the safest with? I I care about physical safety a lot. I mean, look, traveling in the toilet sounds absolutely wonderful, but you know, I uh, I would like to survive the experience. Um, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. I'd be kind of inclined to go with either three or four. Um, I think the third doctor and the fourth doctor, people tended to be pretty safe with them, didn't they? There weren't any there weren't any real disasters. Uh, with those doctors like uh, and also I mean the third doctor is basically my favorite as well but like I think yeah the the other doctors um, I mean the first doctor at, at, at like first season of the first doctor he's kind of scary you know um, and then he sort of mellows out later but he's also just an old man I mean and he's not physically that capable so I don't can't really rely on him to protect me that well um, obviously, the fifth doctor, well, you know, companions died. Lots of people died. It was a very violent, uh, things got very violent at times during his uh, era. Uh, same goes for the sixth doctor. Um, um, seventh is very manipulative. Uh, uh, I, I guess this, so I don't really know much about the eighth doctor because I don't, you know, listen to the audios or anything like that. I only watch the TV, so, TV shows <clears throat> and I thought the movie sucked. <clears throat> So I can't say about the Eighth Doctor. Um, I guess the Ninth Doctor would be fine. Um, yeah, Tenth Doctor is a bit moody. I, I don't think I'd get on so well with him. Um, uh, yeah, I, Eleventh. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm I'm thinking third or fourth. Uh, now, as for the philosopher, well, my initial inclination was to say I would just go with any philosopher who's a, a woman and slutty. Um, you know, because if, if I'm not going to be around any other humans, then you know I want to. <laughs> You know, but then the problem is, is she might be slutty, but just not interested in me. So uh, that could that could be. Uh, yeah, there's no guarantee. Maybe I should go with any philosopher who is physically capable and reasonably courageous. Um, like, I don't know. I mean, if we can choose anyone from any time period, maybe someone like Bertrand Russell, you know, during his 30s or something like that. You know, he's smart and he seemed perfectly physically capable. He seemed pretty courageous. He seemed to have. Kind of values that would fit with a travel in the tires uh so maybe somebody like him i'm not sure i'd really want to go with a philosopher though i i don't i i can do i don't have to be with a philosopher do i i can do philosophy just just like reading about it and and stuff i don't have to have a philosopher with me um so i <laughs> yeah uh but I, I i i don't know but you know nice nice question anyway um but um I don't have any strong feelings about this uh, <coughs> one way or the other. <coughs> uh, ZPO, ZPO asks, does social media make us more or less lonely? 
I guess there's an argument that technology, urbanization, all of that stuff increases loneliness. But, you know, in that context, social media is surely a good thing. Because um, I like, suppose we were to keep everything else fixed, you know, and like all of the technological developments, keep all that fixed, but just remove social media. Would that help? I mean, surely not, right? People would still be very isolated. People would still be atomized. They'd still be cut off from communities. Um, but now they would just have fewer ways of interacting with people. So I don't think that it would uh, improve the situation. Um, and also, like, imagine the recent pandemic without social media. Uh, 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 yeah, that would have made it a lot harder for many people. Um, in any case, like, social media is you know, very broad, a very broad concept. Um, so there are probably some types of social media that increase loneliness or make people feel more lonely. Um, but uh, whether, you know, whether you could say that for all of them, I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's all of the questions. Um, so thank you, everybody, for the questions. And, uh, well, that's all. Goodbye.